So Bloomberg New Energy Finance, which is sort of a consulting and research entity, um, has published its new energy outlook in this uh, 2019. And this is sort of the uh, different approach from a pro-renewable viewpoint to what we had in an earlier power with uh, BP's statistical review of world energy. Um, and I just... I have no access yet to the entire report, but I, they provided some highlights that I feel like uh, there's already enough material so we can comment uh, a little bit on. And uh, so my format will just be to give quotes of their highlights and then uh, give my thoughts on each of them. And maybe Don wants to jump in on any particular point. So uh, in the summary finding, they said, um, Wind and solar by 2050, uh, uh, wind and solar make up almost 50% of world energy in 2050. And they quote then 50 by 50. This is sort of the, the label for this. And help put the power sector on track for two degrees to at least 2030. Um, so this is a, the two degrees Celsius maximum warming um, in the 21st century goal that is uh, connected to the Paris Climate Accord and various programs. And so they, they pro project in their scenario that almost 50% of world energy or, or world electricity will be um, from wind and solar only. So this is, first of all, the dimension is this is global. This is not just a one country or, you know, Europe or whoever is a, is a leader currently in that. But this is global. This includes all of the developing economies that are still at a fraction of energy consumption of the average German or American or uh, developed nation uh, citizen. So this is, a, this is a giant projection. This is, this is much higher than what the IEA, the International Energy Agency or other uh, institutions would project. And uh, we also have to recognize that most of the energy infrastructure that we, we are building today is locked in for many decades. So when we are building a new gas-fired power plant today, a nuclear power plant or coal power plant, this is locked in for many decades, unless you're willing to cripple your economy and throw a lot of uh, good capital away. Uh, so this is this is a very strong prediction already. Um, and then they have some unrealistic numbers in the details. So, for example, 80% renewables in Europe by 2080. Um, okay, 2080 is a long time away, but yeah, I, I don't even believe in that, even though Europe uh, has higher uh, wind and solar numbers than, uh, than other parts of the world. And so the next quote is, wind and solar are now cheapest across more than two-thirds of the world. By 2030, they undercut commissioned coal and gas almost everywhere. And we have discussed this many times on Power Hour, solar and wind, uh, the levelized cost of them uh, have been lowered substantially, of course, over the past decade or so. Uh, but this is not equivalent to the actual total cost of the system that they incur. So there's a, there's a reason why everywhere where solar and wind are adapted uh, to a large degree, they make the electricity system actually uh, more expensive. So Germany, Denmark... Spain had bad experiences, Ontario had bad experiences, Colorado had bad experiences with more wind and solar. So we, we see that the costs escalate there. And then they pretend on the basis of the uh, just the kilowatt hour price uh, for the solar uh, generator or the wind generator, that this would be that is already the cheapest and will be uh, you know, undercutting everything in, in something like 10 or 12 years. So that's a, that's a very unrealistic assumption in my view. The next quote is, consumer energy decisions such as rooftop solar and behind the meter batteries help shape an increasingly decentralized grid the world over. So what does behind the meter mean? That means you build a battery in your basement and then you primarily feed your solar rooftop energy into that battery instead of the power grid and you're a sort of an autark uh, self-supplying entity and you can even provide something like a storage services to the power grid right so you're making money and this is this is a very insane uh, economic assumption to me because what does it mean a decentralized power grid where everyone has a rooftop solar installation and a battery in the basement behind the meter that would mean that you're making a very stupid 
capital allocation at scale, right? Because you are building a small scale uh, system in every house instead of building one big entity, instead of building one big solar power plant somewhere in the desert where it's, where it's most efficient as it can be, or pooling the storage capacity into one big battery, you're building a lot of small inefficient units in every basement. And this is super expensive, of course. This is like manufacturing cars in a small shop, you know, with a few guys building the same car instead of the mass production plan that, you know, Ford or GM would use. This is, this is an insane assumption. And then the assumption might be that on, on a global level, you know, People in Af Africa who can't afford the the standard coal power plant, the centralized power plant, will do that to charge the Tesla. I, I don't think so. So the, the future energy consumption will come from mostly from now developing countries, and I don't I don't think they will go that road, and, and uh, in particular behind the meter thing. So that's a, that's a very unrealistic assumption again. Uh, and then they have another projection that batteries, gas peakers, and dynamic demand will help wind and solar reach more than 80% penetration in some markets. So they're they are predicting batteries, gas peakers, and dynamic demand. What does it mean? So the battery technology, which is now super expensive on a per kilowatt hour basis, will further plummet in prices. Then they curiously include gas peakers in there although we've just learned that batteries will be super cheap, allegedly, so why use a gas peaker at all? You, you have just expensive gas infrastructure when you are having batteries anyways, and they are uh, allegedly more economic. And then dynamic demand. And dynamic demand is a very raises red flags with me because dynamic demand usually means we will uh, sort of deny you access to the power on demand that you would need or want at any given moment because it doesn't fit into the production cycle of solar and wind and whatever storage capacity is available. So this is this is a really interesting assumption that people would actually accept or industries, even big industry producers, you know, that you could curtail their, their demand on power and just uh, um, shut them down momentarily. So I don't, I don't think that works. On a local scale and on a global scale, I think that's totally unfeasible. Um, so I'll just continue with, with a few more. So coal continues to grow in Asia, but collapses everywhere else and peaks globally in 2026. So that's a very precise short-term prediction we'll, we'll see in seven years, I guess. I, I don't believe in it. I think China just picked up pace in coal consumption recently, and it pretty much depends on their economic development. And then again, most of the future energy and, and power consumption will come from now developing countries now that are now poor. And uh, so I don't see that at all. I mean, my reaction to this. So are you think what is the purpose of predictions, right? And the reason to make predictions is that you're trying to guide current action. And so like if if you're a business, you want the best predictions possible so that you can make the best business decisions. But often these kind of public decision or these public projections made by people with no skin in the game, um, they're they're they come from a perspective you want people to take actions like banning fossil fuels. And so what you're going to predict is that like, look, fossil fuels are inevitably going to be banned. And so for instance, investors, yeah, you shouldn't invest in them because you're going to lose out on your investment. And oh yeah, wind and solar will solve everything affordably. So like, let's subsidize them and ban alternatives. And we don't have to worry because look, we have predictions that every, like we're just going to have uh, affordable solar and wind taking over the world. And the, and so, I mean, my policy is basically, I never trust predictions. And in part, it's that like people have a very bad track record for predictions in most things. Um, and I mean, to my knowledge, Bloomberg has no track record. Uh, I, it'd be interesting to go back and look at Bloomberg, which is, you know, concentrated in the financial, you know, center of the financial universe, how predictive they were of what was going to happen to this, you know, to the economy and the stock market and the housing market. Um, what was that, you know, in uh, 2008? And, yeah. and yeah, now it's we're going to predict what's going to happen to like, what's going to be on people's rooftops and in their garages in 2080. 
like it is it's like clearly motivated and clearly i think crazy but the the craziness has a real purpose to it that it's they're trying to get people to buy into a certain conclusion and so you know my question was all right how like put real skin in the game like okay we agree that if in 10 years we are our predictions are off that we will just ne- you know we'll close shop like i would like to see something like that somebody actually stand behind their predictions rather than just throw them out and then get you know a lot of attention for it yeah i i agree that there's some some strong motivation and it's not maybe even a, a sort of conspiracy where everyone says we will we will do this thing it's just that everyone knows what uh, a rosy prediction for renewable business would be right and uh, so i just want to to finish by adding three points to that very quickly so one contradictory thing that i predict is that gas fire power grows by 0.6 percent per year to 2050 so on average every year gas uh, fire power plants capacity will actually grow, grow, grow globally. And this, to me, contradicts the claim that by 2030, everything will be undercut by wind and solar and batteries. So that that's, doesn't make sense to me to start with. And then they also say, well, for, for the two degree um, uh, warming trajectory to avoid the two degree warming, we need, uh, it, again, additional zero carbon technologies and, and more things that do that or even suck CO2 out of the atmosphere or something like that. So it, all of this, this giant like Green New Deal style overhaul of the power sector globally on a global scale in every country isn't even enough to serve that goal. And then finally, as is so often the case, for nuclear, they predict uh, even a percentage decline globally. So the one technology where I would say, okay, so this has a short long term to significantly reduce global CO2 emissions by replacing a lot of fossil fuels and and catching up with fossil fuels uh, that they predict is, you know, nowhere, not even stagnating, it's declining overall. So that definitely is a hint at at some uh, attitude, I would say.